Okay, thanks to David and Angela for the uh, kind introductory words. And uh, the first talk of the first session is uh, being held by Annelise Giraud from uh, University of uh, Genève. And she will talk about speech processing and auditory cortex with and without oscillations. Um, well, it's super nice to be here. Thanks for organizing this. Uh, I've never talked in front of an audience where I can uh, feel so many friends. You know, it's like a family. It's very well, nice. Still friends now. No. <laughs> yeah, no, but I know the spirit. You know, if, even if we talk rubbish, they, 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 they stay friends. That's the point. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about my own obsession, uh, uh, which is to, to, to try to, to understand what computation oscillations can do or whether they don't do any, uh, anything and they are just the fumes. <laughs> so this is my own obsession. And uh, uh, most of uh, what I'm going to talk today is, is about models that we are trying to, to, to modeling works we are trying to do in, the, in my lab. Uh, so I say trying because it's very complicated. Uh, maybe it's going to be, you know, uh, there, there are no answers. Uh, it's just efforts. So uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so first of all, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, these people who are the people who did the job. Uh, and especially, I mean, Luke is in the, the audience. You look younger, Luke, in this, on this picture. You need a, we need an update. Uh, yes, I mean, younger and less young people. <laughs> Uh, okay, so speech um, is, a, is a special biological signal because it's a, it's a signal produced by our own brain. It's produced by our motor system, by the periodicity of the motor system, by the turbulences uh, that are uh, going on in the uh, vocal uh, apparatus. And this uh, results in a quasi-periodic signal. And because uh, the brain also has some periodic uh, type of activity, uh, the idea we, we worked on for, for the last 10 years now is uh, this potential uh, specific interaction that, that can happen between the rhythmicity of speech and the rhythmicity of the brain signals. Uh, voila. Okay, so when, when you uh, uh, look into the human brain in the auditory cortex and uh, with uh, intracortical EEG uh, at rest, you can see that there is uh, uh, some structure in the activity. Uh, uh, so uh, these oscillations seem to be present at rest. And, and of course, their structure changes when speech uh, enters in the system. Uh, and that's what we want to study. So I like this slide, although uh, I think Benjamin did it. Where, where is Benjamin? And, and, and uh, we all agree that it's completely junk, actually. But I use it because <laughs> I find it very didactic. I would like someone to reproduce this. Um, so when, when we try to cross-correlate uh, uh, speech with the brain response in auditory cortex, we actually uh, see that there is this, uh, this interaction, this sort of resonance in three uh, big domains in the theta, in the low beta, and in the, the gamma domain. And I like this slide because uh, it tells us that at, at the onset of speech, you have this uh, theta and gamma uh, interaction, but that the low beta uh, interaction is sort of delayed, which for me was, was matter for thinking about beta uh, involved in, this, uh, in predictions that, that take place you know, after you've, you've, you, the, the system has looped at least once. Okay, so the hypothesis uh, that uh, these oscillation domains reflect specific and important computations, this is what the, the big question we are uh, after. Uh, okay, so uh, as you know, oscillations uh, take place in, in, uh, in specific uh, regions of, of the cortex, of the cortical column, in superficial and deep layers. And uh, uh, with David, we... we we tried to, to uh, uh, hypothesize a few things that, that are wrong. I mean, we know that, but that, that help us uh, progress and think. At the time, we thought that we have to, to conceptualize uh, the, these uh, theta and gamma oscillations that are involved in bottom-up uh, speech processing as, as some 
some machinery that, that takes that that is localized in superficial layers, and so so the, the signal enters layer four and then is somehow processed in superficial layers and goes out of it in a more structured uh, way, uh, and especially with al alternation of coding uh, periods and, and, and some more lat latent or silent periods that are important for decoding. And Oded's uh, uh, work actually uh, uh, is, uh, uh, informs us a lot about uh, the importance of that, that uh, decoding time. Uh, well, in more detail, this is what we, uh, what we, uh, what we proposed, which again uh, is, is becoming more and more wrong, but uh, uh, it was useful. So we thought that uh, when, when uh, there is this uh, train of spiking in, uh, in the f uh, layer four of, of the auditory cortex with a big onset um, um, activity, it's going to re reset uh, theta and gamma uh, oscillations that are inherently present. And the re this reset actually structures them and nests them. And ideally, if things are, well, ideal, uh, there should be some alignment between the excitability phases uh, with the moments of speech where there is something important to code, basically the onset of syllables. Uh, but so, so yeah, so the, the, this scale, the theta, uh, is the scale that is important for syllable parsing, and this scale, the gamma scale, is important for phoneme en encoding. Again, these are hypotheses. Uh, and this uh, silent period could be uh, uh, important conceptually uh, for top-down prediction to, to, uh, to exert themselves and interfere with the, uh, interact with the process, the, the perception process. Um, so uh, this model actually emphasized the, 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 the importance of nesting, of coupling between theta and gamma oscillations. And, uh, uh, recently, with Alexia Phil, uh, we, we proposed um, uh, this view uh, that connects architectures with function. And in the speech domain, we are in this situation where uh, we have uh, gamma, uh, gamma and theta um, oscillators that are both uh, uh, that have a common input with speech, and then we have this nest nesting that is uh, highly driven by the stimulus itself uh, for other um, uh, cognitive functions of oscillations. The same kind of coupling between low and fast oscillation could come from a totally different architecture. So we cannot really totally generalize uh, from, uh, from what's going on uh, uh, in the hippocampus uh, to what, what we have in speech. Um, Okay, so um, basic, uh, basic observations uh, with uh, intracortical EEG. Uh, this is what we get from the auditory cortex. So the, the, this guy has an electrode here. Uh, when, when, uh, when the guy hears a sentence, then you have a, a structured activity with a gamma and theta uh, activity. If you go to a more associative region, then you see that the, the profile is completely different. And uh, what is it? if you cross-correlate speech with this activity, you see that the cross-correlation uh, is mostly here in the... In the in the theta and gamma uh, um, frequencies uh, for early uh, auditory regions, whereas here, this gamma activity doesn't find a counterpart in the speech signal. So this is really an endogenous thing. And the beta, actually, is more, is more cross-correlating and, and resonating. If you look, we can see also that the cross-frequency coupling profile is very different in these regions. And, and there is something to understand from that, but what, I mean, to me, this is very complicated to make sense of these electrophysiological data. And, and, uh, and of course, we can do clever designs and everything, but uh, being a, an impatient person, I thought that uh, what we should do is, is go to computational uh, modeling and really try to find out by building models what oscillations can do to the speech signal. So the aim was to explore a potential causal role of oscillations in speech processing. And the approach, in the first approach, was to model biologically plausible oscillations, not simply, you know, oscillators, but something that, that 
is that has the potential to be realistic. And uh, we did it this way. Uh, we built, you know, a model with uh, uh, two oscillators uh, that that uh, with neurons that have um, uh, some some realism which are leaky integrate and fire neurons. Uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, gamma excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, theta uh, excitatory inhibitory. And importantly, we couple the two uh, systems, the two oscillating networks together uh, to produce this nesting. Uh, voila. And this is what we get. Uh, so what we measure, uh, uh, what we want to measure is the output of the excitatory uh, gamma neurons. So this is what we have. So each point here uh, is the activity from one neuron. We have uh, like 100 of gamma neuron and less from, from the theta network. And you see that at rest, we have spontaneous gamma activity, spontaneous theta. But when speech kicks in, uh, everything gets more structured. The theta activity uh, becomes clear. And then the gamma uh, becomes uh, informative. Um, we wanted to first assess whether a theta oscillator built that way with some uh, biological plausibility uh, could really play a role in speech uh, segmentation, syllable segmentation. So we compared actually the model, which is what we call a pinth, uh, you know, in, in uh, comparison with the ping for gamma. Uh, with some, some models that are more simple, uh, just a, a simple acoustic uh, boundary detector. And also, we compared it with um, a state-of-the-art uh, uh, algorithm for syllabification, which is the Mermelstein algorithm, which works offline. Uh, and when we compared, uh, we uh, found out that the theta oscillator is actually the one that does the best. Um, so that was, uh, that was uh, cool. <laughs> I mean, uh, the interest of this is that it works online, whereas this, uh, this uh, Mermelstein algorithm works only offline. Uh, if you compare what the theta uh, oscillator does uh, to, in comparison with human listeners, you see that it, it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, so it, it was good, and, and a guy actually from uh, automatic speech recognition uh, domain came to me, to us, sorry, uh, to, to, uh, and, and, and said, okay, I would like to try this uh, um, in, in, uh, on, on, you know, in a more uh, engineering way. And actually, they, 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 he, he worked with Alex Yafil, and they uh, concluded that uh, it does better than anything else. So I... I I show this because uh, uh, really um, it, it also tells us that our work is not totally useless and can be, you know, have some, some impact uh, at the engineering level. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, uh, what we wanted to... So th this was about theta, now I'm going to talk about gamma. We wanted to uh, actually uh, see uh, what's coming out of the gamma excitatory neurons and whether this could uh, encode the content of syllables. Uh, so we, uh, we actually uh, decoded this activity with a, uh, uh, with a classifier. Uh, and we used different codes and different networks to compare. So we used a uh, simple code where we take uh, simply the count of the spike uh, within uh, a theta cycle, and another more complicated code where we take into account the, the, the phase, we label the spikes by the different, uh, the different uh, um, phases of the, 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 the theta cycle which we call the phase partition code. We also uh, compared different var variants of, of our uh, model, uh, the intact version, but also a version where theta and gamma are uncoupled, because we want to see uh, w whether the coupling is important, and also a version where the theta is not driven by, by uh, the speech input, meaning that you have an ongoing theta, but, uh, so it, it might help, but it's not, you know, uh, it's not um, uh, receptive, receptive to the, the stimulus, uh, to the syllable boundaries. And this is what we get. 
So this is the decoding we have. So you see the, 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 the variations we have that are really tiny. So the good news is that we reached about 60% of uh, syllable recognition with the intact model using the spike pattern, so using the phase of theta activity uh, to, to, to label uh, the gamma content. Uh, and the other versions, uh, so either spike count and also all the, the, the versions were worked less, but you see the difference is really minimum. So, I mean, it's kind of so-so results, but still uh, informative and perhaps encouraging. Okay, so theta oscillations can segment speech by signaling online syllable acoustic boundaries. Gamma oscillations can provide a code for phonemic encoding. And gamma activity is better decoded when spiking is informed by the phase of theta activity. I think we are safe with these conclusions. Um, okay, so now we know that the, 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 speech, the human speech system uh, is resilient to speech compression. So there are fast speakers and slow speakers, and our brain can cope with this. To, for, uh, within certain limits. And we know that if we compress by three, we start losing comprehension. So uh, we, we looked at uh, the performance of the model depending on, on compression, and we saw some resilience when we compress by two, uh, and even by three, but you know, the human performance would rather be like this. Uh, so we're far from, uh, from uh, being realistic here. Um, okay, so an important notion that is missing from this model, I mean, I, I think it was clear to you that the model was just a bottom-up model. So no notion of, of, of top-down. And we thought that a big thing that is missing is the notion of top-down. Of course, there are many other things that are missing that could contribute to the, the difference in this uh, uh, behavior. But now uh, we explore the, 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 the top-down uh, aspect in this. Uh, to sort of have a notion where we are heading to, uh, we did this very simple experiment. So uh, it was Maria and Luc uh, who did this. Um, we uh, had people listen to uh, speech and, and compressed speech with EG. Can't be more simple than that. There was first a behavioral experiment where uh, we could uh, really uh, quote uh, the, the comprehension in a in a. Um, a precise way, and during the EG experiment, we just asked the subject to rate themselves uh, subjectively their comprehension, and we got similar results. So we thought that we can go on with the with the with the behavior we have uh, during the EEG experiment. Um, so first, uh, we wanted to have a notion of uh, syllable uh, rate uh, tracking. Uh, by the theta range activity. And here uh, we use two approach. So the, in, in both cases, it's speech EEG uh, cross-correlation, uh, the, the, the basic notion, either with a shared power or with uh, phase locking. <clears throat> so here, uh, what you see is that, so this is compression by one, two, and three. So the blue line here is above the two others. Here, uh, the red line is above the two others, and here the uh, purple line is above the two others, meaning that we, we see some, some displacement of the theta rhythm uh, to track the syllable rhythm. What is important is to see that it crosses this, uh, how did you call it, this alpha, the, the <laughs> slice. <laughs> so it, it, it goes past the alpha rhythm, uh, and uh, so I don't think that here the 10 hertz activity can be conceptualized in terms of alpha. It is alpha, strictly speaking, but here we see that it displaces, so it's not alpha. This is rather a theta that's moving. Uh, the important thing to, to note here for ODED, especially ODED, is that we go beyond 9 hertz. So ODED, maybe you're going to talk about that. ODED has this uh, notion that 9 hertz is a, is a limit for the theta uh, rhythm, is, is, a, is the capacity of the theta rhythm to, uh, to segments into syllables. And here we tend to see something else. And again, I mean, this gives us the same sort of, uh, of results that, that, uh, that, that 9 hertz is not a limit, and that theta is not limited in terms of comprehension. Because I remind you that for a compression factor of three, 
comprehension drops, uh, but theta does not. So uh, we did a GLM analysis where we tried to dissociate syllable rate and uh, <coughs> serial rate tracking and comprehension. So we had two uh, regressors that were sort of uh, uh, orthogonal. And um, here, <coughs> that's what we get with the mean, uh, with the syllable rate uh, factor. Uh, these are all the electrodes. And here we see something uh, in the theta range and something in the gamma range in opposite direction. This is power, this is not phase. Uh, and both are significant. So actually, if we just look at the stimulus driven uh, neural activity, we go to, we, we see, uh, you know, these two frequencies that we think are involved in bottom-up processing. So this confirms really what, what, we, what we thought. And if we look at comprehension, so this regressor, then we see uh, big activity in the uh, beta range. This is also significant. So here we, we know what we have to deal with. So theta and gamma for bottom-up and beta for top-down. Probably comprehension, maybe top-down. Uh, <clears throat> so theta and gamma power are sensitive to syllable rate. Theta follows syllable rate, but the quality of gamma encoding decreases, and beta power signals follows, drives speed co comprehension. Uh, I skip this one because I, I'm going to... Uh, I, I don't have a, a lot of time. <laughs> okay, so um, this... Uh, Gamma up beta down scheme had been hypothesized before by Wang in 2010 and confirmed experimentally by many of, of, of I mean, some people in this room actually, uh, and also by us. And I'm going to show you our little side of the story, the, the quick and dirty uh, uh, study that we did uh, that, that, that also uh, leads us to this conclusion. Um, so, again, this guy with the uh, electrode in auditory cortex. Uh, and what we, uh, we assessed here, so it was a, just listening to a sentence, um, we did two types of analysis. One was directional nesting, so we, we asked what does the phase of low frequency activity in the region in association cortex modulates the power uh, in the high frequency domain in the lower area, that in an area that is hierarchically below. Uh, so that's what we have here, uh, and in the bottom-up direction we have things in the theta range, in the top-down direction we have things in the alpha-beta uh, range. Uh, we couple that with Granger causality because this directional nesting doesn't really give us an idea of, of, of directionality. Uh, if we couple that with Granger causality and we look at the overlap, so there is the overlap for bottom-up in theta, five minutes, <laughs> thanks, uh, and the overlap uh, for the top-down uh, in the, you know, sort of beta range. Okay, so this confirms what I just said. Uh, another interesting and I find super important result that we get was uh, to find out whether uh, this, this upgoing uh, gamma downgoing beta was sort of uh, uh, um, simultaneous or whether it was an alternation of uh, bottom up and top down. And uh, looking at, at this kind of, of uh, uh, plot, uh, it seems uh, uh, obvious that it's actually uh, alternating. And we did some more analysis and we found an alternation rate, um, you know, sort of in the theta range. Uh, is this too slow? Uh, is this true? I mean, I hope uh, we, we can have more information in the future about that. Is this too slow? I think it's slower than what Nancy proposed. Uh, Nancy, are you still the only one? Uh, uh, saying things about that. I mean, I find the, the notion really, really super interesting and important. Anyway, so we, we'll, we'll know in the future uh, what's this alternation rate. 
Okay, so how to now how to incorporate the notion of beta down in speech processing models? This is the question we ask in the lab. Is there an advantage of having alternating bottom up and top down flows? Can we relate gamma up beta down notions to the no, to the notion of prediction and prediction errors? You know, because this is a purely uh, physiological scheme. But if you listen to uh, people like Carl Friston, you should find a way to to connect the two the two worlds and and uh, and and. See see uh, you know, whether uh, you have the, the downgoing flow is actually a, a predictive flow and the, the feed-forward flow, uh, 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 flow of prediction errors. This is really still a, a, big, uh, a big field of research for the future. I skipped this. Uh, okay, and ju I just want to... I have one, two minutes? Three? Wow. Okay, so... Um, so we think that there are two, at least, possible approaches. One would be uh, to create realistic oscillation models, the same kind as I um, um, showed you before, with spiking neurons. But it's going to be very difficult because we need, uh, you know, we need. Uh, if we want to do that, we need several stages. We need uh, auditory cortex plus a, ha a stage where there is a, you know, integration, a word level or a syllable level. Uh, so it's going to be difficult, or we go for a predictive coding model with idealized oscillation, which is a, an easier way. And I just want to, to show you a few slides about this work. So this is a work that, that's done currently by Sevada, Hofsepian, and, and Itzasola Sagasti. Uh, so the, the, this model has an input level uh, where, uh, from speech, uh, there are two, two things that are extracted, uh, the envelope and the spectrogram. Um, we have a theta oscillator, but not the, the biophysical type, really uh, some, some really stupid uh, theta oscillator that tracks the envelope. Uh, and when, when uh, uh, the envelope reaches a certain threshold, then it starts the activity of timing units. And these timing units have a, have a time constant of 25 milliseconds, which, which is our way to emulate the, the, the gamma uh, activity. So there is no gamma oscillation in this model. It's just gamma by, uh, by means of integration uh, at the, on the scale of 25 milliseconds. Uh, so with this uh, series of, of uh, timing units, there is encoding of syllables. And, and there is connection with a syllable pool, uh, which we call the content level, uh, where each uh, unit uh, corresponds to a learned uh, spectrotemporal pattern. So uh, each unit is described by its activity level, uh, which continuously varies during the inference process. And this is, I, I show you how it works. So here we have syllable two that, that presents itself. So syllable two. So here there is, the, the model is, is sort of uh, at rest. And then there is a hesitation between uh, syllable two and syllable four. And, uh, you know, by uh, iteration and, and, and predictions and prediction errors, <laughs> uh, then uh, syllable uh, uh, two wins at the end. Uh, so, just to sh show you to have a sense of the performance of the model, of the behavior of the model, uh, this is a sentence we try to, uh, to decode. Uh, the equipment needs proper maintenance, and I'm going to show you uh, for the, these three syllables what's going on. Um, so here, for needs, you see the blue uh, at the end wins, so it's a correct recognition. Pro, you see the red winning at the end, it's correct. And uh, here, uh, you, you have at the end something that is more yellow and it, it, it doesn't work. And this is a version of the model where we remove the theta oscillator. If we, if we, if we uh, leave the theta oscillations, then we have uh, something that, that, that works well. So this is another way to probe the role of these oscillations. Uh, just more quantitative uh, uh, results. Uh, we see that the model with oscillation gives less prediction errors than without oscillations. Okay, uh, so next step for this work uh, is actually to, to, to implement more oscillations. So at the moment, oscillations are only emulated by timing process at specific model stages. Uh, 
uh, there is a continuous flow of top-down and bottom-up information. So the way the model is implemented really uh, is, is a constant you know, flow uh, you know, uh, up and down. So what we, need to, what we want to do in the next step is to actually have a flow that has a temporal structure that is in itself oscillating. Because we want to know uh, whether there is a, there is a, uh, a real uh, function for uh, predictions to be actually sent down uh, on a beta uh, scale. And we're going to play with that to find out uh, what's the optimum. Voila. I think that's all. So uh, uh, maybe I just go through this. The remaining important issues for us are how to relate neural oscillations with the notions of predictive coding and, and prediction, uh, well, predictions and prediction errors. Uh, are predictions and prediction errors explicitly computed at what scale? So this is a topic that uh, interests us with Nancy. Uh, how do beta and theta gamma oscillations physically interact? That's also something I, I would like to, to have a sense of with uh, computation work. Uh, and, and does a neural beta activity convey in co information content predictions or it's just a routing tool? Voila. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> okay, so thanks, Annelise. Um, I'm sure there are many questions. So where's the microphone? Ah, okay. So you want to go around? Ah. No questions? Uh, Nancy. <laughs> You have your own microphone, you just push the button in front of you and then... Thank you for a really good talk. Um, this is more of a comment than it is a question, but it, it's about a discussion about all of this. You were making a distinction between biophysically realistic models and um, uh, more phenomenological mm -hmm. models, and I just wanted to make things still more difficult. Yeah. Um, I know. <laughs> That is, it's true that the biophysically, uh, biophysical models are more difficult to deal with, but uh, an essential point about them is that they can be made in very many ways, so that a theta oscillation, for example, can come about as interactions with um, inhibitory cells, which is mm -hmm. the kind that you were talking about, but also single cell oscillators can be theta oscillations. Mm -hmm. And those different kinds of biophysically detailed uh, descriptions of oscillators can have immensely different um, properties with respect to what happens when you try to entrain them or when they interact with mm -hmm. other kinds of rhythms like gamma rhythms. So, um, to add to your list of remaining important issues, uh, one really has to understand the biophysical nature of the oscillations in order to ask the kinds of questions that I, I agree are really important. Mm. I completely agree. I mean, really, this is a clumsy attempt that we did. But, I mean, uh, I wish we could do more. Uh, well, actually, if you saw what I proposed to, to Alex Yafil initially as, as a model, that, that was something that came from, from more detail, but that was simply n not possible for for the people I had, but I, I think this is super important to, to go in this direction, super important. So, yeah, maybe in your lab, Nancy. Yeah. With help. <laughs> no questions. Uh, I have one only. Um, so I, I, I thought it was super interesting, the model that you presented with the needs proper, mm -hmm. you know, the, the second one, but I was actually at the same time wondering how do you think the words get put together? Right, because here you showed us how you decode every syllable, mm -hmm. right? But proper needs mm -hmm. to somehow put together mm -hmm. these two. Yeah, yeah. So do you have any, you know? It's another follow-up, actually, is to have a word level. Uh, but pff, uh, but I'm not even sure we would answer well, no, because, I mean, it, it wouldn't solve the problem, but we need to have a, a concept about what brings syllables together, exactly. which is beyond my, uh, the scope of, of my uh, 
you know, of what I can do in my, in my lifetime, you know. I don't think I will have time to go uh, beyond uh, this stage, actually. But, I mean, Delta can be uh, something we, we, we have to think about in this context, but, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the specific question in that case is how do you think that, say, it's lower oscillations would interact Can you... With, uh, how do you think it's lower oscillations would interact with beta, for instance? Because you, in, in your model, yeah. beta was kind of the prediction, right? So mm -hmm. it was doing the, the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. In a way, it was... I imagine that where you're going is that you would be putting... By the time you hear pro, you would have some, you know, ideas of what you would hear next. Mm -hmm. So uh, how would the, 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 you know... So, so I mean, prediction now we seem to, to come to the idea that delta and beta maybe work together in a, in a predictive context. Do we... I mean, last time in Frankfurt, last year, I think it was one of our conclusions, and I was happy to see that in, on your slides it was the same color for delta and beta. So I think this idea is sort of... Uh, spreading, and, uh, but we have to demonstrate still, no? I mean, maybe there will be some demonstration. Uh, but I mean, that does not answer your question, I'm afraid, uh, Lucia. We can discuss later. Right. <laughs> Who did? So, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, during her talk, at least waved no, no, with the finger when she talked about Maria's talk because I was looking at my computer and she was upset that I'm not listening. But I was listening and I looked there uh, because I wanted to share with you some discussions I had with Maria about this, uh, I think, very interesting observation they had that you, uh, you know, theta oscillations went beyond nine hertz, which is the capacity, and yet, you had, um, uh, uh, you know, intelligibility dropped. So this is the kind of... And the thing that we came uh, up with after discussing it, that's what I want to share with you, is that if you look at Nursky's data, you know, EcoG and looking at uh, response to speech, uh, the theta appears at the core level. Of, and... Uh, the question is whether tempo, you know, the model and, mm. and the idea that there is a phase lock loop, oscill you know, a, 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 a structure that, that traces the, the, the syllabic rate, maybe it appears after the core. Yes, but if this is, I mean, in this case, you have to take into account other things than theta, than just theta. You have to take into account other gamma and beta, I think. And, and you know, the... the the capacity, I think, that, that we have to focus on now is the gamma capacity. Well, you know, uh, I think, you know, that you don't need to have beta in that level. And, you, you know, you can uh, show insensitivity to time compression without top down, just by bottom up. And yeah. the big question is how come that in your uh, measurements, Theta goes beyond the nine hertz, and intelligibility drops at nine. Hertz. So that that's going to be, a, you know, a long discussion that maybe we pursue here and 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 at Brycoco next Brycoco. Uh, Pascal has a question. It's more a comment on this because if I understand Anlis correctly, then the idea is that within a theta cycle, right? There is basically a negotiation mm. taking place where multiple uh, gamma cycles are needed and multiple beta cycles are needed to basically negotiate an interpretation to settle mm -hmm. on an interpretation, yep. right? So I, I could imagine that theta is basically in training to a certain degree, but if you don't fit enough uh, gamma and uh, beta cycles into it, a, a sufficient number of bottom-up and top-down cycles, you don't... Uh, with a sufficient fidelity, settle on an interpretation of, of a syllable, and so you do have some entrainment of theta, but your your intelligibility your your um, uh, intelligibility will go down. Isn't that a plausible? Uh, concept? I think Oded bases base, uh, bases his uh, his conviction on the fact that he used uh, stimuli that were non-predictable, that were meaningless. Uh, so, but still, I mean, digits or even, I mean, there are still, uh, you know, enough, I think there is still enough meaning for, for at least considering the possibility that, <laughs> that you're right. 
I would like to uh, return to this point after my talk, because I addressed it during the talk, and I don't want to take time here on this. Can I just add one comment to this? Because I think if, it's, if this is exactly the case, that, that there is basically a uh, multiple loops of this are necessary to settle on the correct syllable, then I think it's not a question about whether there is information content in the top-down beta or whether it's just a, a, a routing tool. Because if there is basically multiple alternative interpretations mm. in a lower mm. area mm. that are basically competing for being signaled mm. uh, bottom up, and the top-down prediction gives more weight uh, to one of them, mm -hmm. then in one and the same uh, instance, the top-down beta is conveying some sort of content. Yeah, and sure. by giving a routing, a, a, a biased routing, a, a, mm -hmm. a priority routing to one of the, beta, mm -hmm. the, the, the gamma-encoded oscillators, it thereby is also a routing tool, so it's the same yeah, thing. Right? Exactly. So I think r routing is one aspect, and time is the other aspect. You know, integration time, and and that that is information in a way, uh, and this is precisely what we want to play with the model uh, I presented last. You know, I. Personally, I really want to, to have a notion of, of what information uh, uh, is provided by the time scale of beta. Why beta at this time scale? Because it's not, it's not any beta. This is a beta that is really like around 14 hertz. You know, and we find it always at that frequency. Why this frequency? Why, computationally, uh, why is it important? Mm. Mm? Okay. So, <laughs> yes, I was wondering whether um, you think about the beta as encoding um, statistical structure, like for example the transitions between phonemes that you can, so if you if the theta entrains at syllabic level, then there is the possibility of, you know, um, looking into the statistics within the syllable and then uh, deciding where to go left or right based on the transitional probabilities. Mm. <gasps> I have no clue. I mean, uh, statistics, you mean online statistics? Yeah. Mm, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I haven't thought about it, but I would say no until you know, my spontaneous uh, reaction is no, but maybe, uh, maybe uh, you're, you're, yeah, you're right. Mm? Yes, Simon. So, okay, final question. Uh, I don't know what I'm the only one who's puzzled here, but um, I, I found your uh, experiment super interesting with the compressed speech. But I'm a bit puzzled that you can call this still theta when it's a totally different frequency. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I appreciate uh, mm -hmm. it subserving a similar function as in the separation of, 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 mm -hmm. of speech things that mm -hmm. I don't know anything about. But um, Maybe you're entraining a total different network, a total different, you know, neural circuit, and it's trying to do the same job that Theta is doing usually, and it just does not such a good job at it. But it's, it, it, in, in that case, it wouldn't be Theta at 14 hertz. If you, so are you, it so sense? you're talking about Theta versus like Alpha, for instance? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah? What, 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 so for instance, if I'm making an, an uh, analogy like in training the visual system, right? Mm -hmm. We just flick a stimuli, then we wouldn't think about one rhythm that we're, you know, driving at fre different frequencies, but we would think mm -hmm. of different frequencies, mm -hmm. so. No, that's, um, that's why I think we, we try to make this distinction or this point in the paper that we call it theta. I mean, uh, we shouldn't call it theta, but uh, like, Tracking rhythm, speech tracking rhythm. Yeah. But I think this is important to to uh, to accept that this is not alpha, in the sense of what the alpha does usually. Yeah, I I guess my point is, say for instance, you have particular neurons, right, that usually have that have different time constants and stuff, and they usually track the syllables at a particular rate, and that would give you the theta, you know, and that's what they do in the natural case, and they're really good at it, and that's why speech works very good at this frequency. And then you entrain in a whole different frequency, so these neurons, they fall out, they, 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 they can't follow mm -hmm. at, at, at this rate, or just at any, you know, other odd 
sample mm -hmm. or something, uh, and then you're driving a completely different network. You still get a, you still can measure this entrainment signature with with EEG, but it's like a, 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 a total different thing. Does Could be, uh, but what we have is in a selection of uh, auditory electrodes, uh, so a totally different network would be probably would have a different yeah yeah sure but spatial. with one electrode you measure like a whole ton. well this is i mean this is a good point i mean this is an uh, yeah surely an important point uh, which would need to be addressed with the uh, intracortical uh, maybe we can continue this point yeah. later and yes. now let's thank annalise again and move on to the next speaker